But I thought we'd talk about something in the, uh, in the middle of all that. Think about this. What was going to be the second act of the gospel? Because the first act really ended with a real bang. Jesus died on the cross and then was raised again on the third day, appearing to uh, hundreds of people to confirm the fact that he really was raised from the dead. He met for about 40 days with his apostles, training them, preparing them, and then right before he ascends to heaven, he gives them their marching orders. Therefore, and go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He go, tells them to, the command really is not to go, the command is to make disciples. And you're going to make disciples in two ways. You're going to baptize believers and you're going to teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. But my question is, I think that could look many different ways other than the way that we're used to it looking. Jesus could have said, I want you to go and give people a creed to believe and a lifestyle to live. In other words, go into all the world to make disciples and tell those disciples that uh, you're to live in a certain way and you believe certain things, but without commanding them to, uh, to have relationships with each other. In other words, Christians could be like vegans, you know, believing certain things and having a certain lifestyle, but no real connection with each other. Vegans don't have national meetings or secret handshakes or all that kind of thing. They believe some weird stuff and they practice some weird stuff, but they don't have any relationship together. The other extreme would be he could have told them to create communes for believers to live in. And this has been tried by believers at times, right? Where you go and you live together, you work together, you train your kids together, you worship together, you work together, you stay together so that you're just around people just like you. There are those today that uh, believe the world has gotten so bad that uh, we, we need to, uh, to go into communes. Uh, it's the stay away from the world. But what God called us to was community. He, he called us to believe certain things and to live in a certain way, but he called us to live in relationship with other people that believe those things and were committed to live in that way. But he calls us to live in the world and among the world so that our different beliefs and our different lifestyle will have an impact on the world. So as we look and we see the gospel taking root uh, in the very first uh, Christians, we see that they are called together into this community that we know of as the church. A, a church where they worship and study together. The very first description of that very first church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, which the word fellowship there is actually the word for community to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So they were together as they worshiped and studied together. But also they shared their material possessions together. Since many of them were from out of town and, and, and didn't have ways to live, those that had stuff shared with them. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They were in such community together, in such relationship, they were willing to share their stuff with each other. They also shared their life experiences together. Their lives were all wrapped around one another. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So they were living to where they were meeting together. You know, they often pointed out this is both a large group and small group thing. They were going to Solomon's Colonnade in the temple where thousands of people to, would meet. In fact, the very first time they met together, 3,000 were baptized. The next, there were 5,000 men. So they were growing and they were meeting together in this large open area, open area colonnade. But then they were also sharing lives together in their homes where they ate together 
broke bread. That can mean sharing a common meal, table fellowship. It can mean also the Lord's Supper. That language is used uh, for both of those. So they were sharing life experiences. They were simply together. All the believers were together and had everything in common. So those early Christians would spend time together in this community. Um, and and they, their lives were wrapped around each other. They stayed together uh, until persecution drove them out of Jerusalem. Only the church leaders stayed in Jerusalem and everybody else was scattered. And that's when churches began to be formed. Because, you see, they didn't just make disciples. They made communities. Communities that we would call churches. I think I've shared this story before. The very first time I got in trouble for changing something. This would have been in 1990, maybe 91. Can't remember exactly. So really, I, I was here as the minister for 10 years or so before I really got in trouble for changing something. And what I changed was coffee. We, we did just built a family room uh, and um, for the first time in our church history, we were able to have two simultaneous adult classes. Before that, the adults met uh, in here, and that was, the, that was the adult class. So I decided that it would be a good idea to promote fellowship in a little more of a relaxed atmosphere if I put the coffee pot on and we'd have coffee during, uh, during class. And I had somebody come charging up to me after church and said, this was a, almost a direct quote as, as well as I can remember it from 30 plus years ago. I didn't come to church to drink coffee. I came to church to worship God. Well, the first part, this guy didn't drink coffee. He was well-known, an anti-coffee guy. And number two, he never came to a Sunday school class in his life. It wasn't like he was coming to my class. It's just that he heard that we had coffee, and he was against it because we never had had that uh, before. Well, the reason I tell that story, besides the fact that it's really fun sometimes to look back on the things we argued about back then, uh, you know, that just reminded me, I forgot to make coffee this morning. Uh, we're going back to serving coffee uh, before uh, church, so I've got to remember to do that. Um, ask this question. You know, he said, I didn't come to church to drink coffee. Now, I did point out to him, by the way, did you come to church to use the bathroom? Because we offer restrooms, you know. <laughs> so uh, that his, his argument really didn't hold a lot of sense. But um, why do we come to church? Think about that. Why is it that we come to church? Well, the first answer would be, uh, you know, in what Ray said so many years ago, to worship God. Did we come this morning to worship God? Of course we did. We have come to worship and praise God. It's such a powerful thing to blend our voices together with other people so that we're not the only ones to say, I love Jesus. Everybody here together is saying it together. I had a professor one time that said that he came to church because he didn't want to go to hell. That didn't mean that, you know, that he thought that he would go to hell if he didn't come to church every week. But his point was, the people that are interested in going to heaven are in this place. So he wants to hang around with these folks because out there, a lot of people are on their merry way to the other place. So every once in a while, you need to hang around people that are committed to going to heaven. And, and then, you know, there's a habit involved. You can have good habits. You know, so many times the habits that we have um, are, uh, you know, bad ones, but we can make good habits. And, and so we have a habit of going to... When I was growing up, we never one time had a discussion. You know, are we going to go to church this week? It was just a given. If it was Sunday or Wednesday night, or if they were having something else at the building, we were going to be there. And that's a good habit uh, to, to be in. And then, um, you know, we've come to learn something about God. It, there, is, there is something about studying the Bible together and, and having a, a powerful uh, revelation, you know, that somebody brings up something and we've learned something about God that we can go. In fact, that's one of the prayers we often pray, that we can use what we've learned today to go back into the world and be better disciples. 
Now, I would add caveat. Um, if you introduce something that's way, a little bit too different from what people have understood before, uh, they react. Uh, 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 you know, they, sometimes we don't really want to learn something. We want to have what we already know affirmed. <laughs> but, but hopefully we're open to where we, we want to learn things about the Bible. So those are some of the reasons we come uh, to church, right? Well, um, maybe. Are we supposed to worship God at other times other than church? If any of you is happy, let him wait until you get to church to sing a song? No, we're supposed to be worshiping God in, in song and in prayer and all those things all the time. Um, is the only th time we're supposed to learn something when we come to church? Aren't we supposed to be exposing ourselves to scripture every day? Aren't we supposed to be maybe listening to sermons, listening to podcasts, reading books, trying, having conversations uh, with people to try to learn things about God other times? And um, is the only reason we come together? But, you know, see, that's one of the things the pandemic did to us. A lot of people that, um, uh, that were in a lifelong habit of coming to church got out of that habit for a year or more during the pandemic. And it's really hard for us maybe to get back in that particular habit. All right, here's where maybe I say something that can get me in trouble with some folks. So, um, you know, if, if, if this causes you too much of a stretch, then just go back and get you a cup of coffee and uh, try to get over it. Um, the main point of the assembly is the assembly. The reason we are to come together is because there is something powerful about being together with other Christians. That we live our lives scattered among people that don't share our... And there is just something about coming together as God's people where we do worship together, we do study together, we, we, we do uh, commune together around the Lord's table. But we also stand around in the lobby after church is over and talk about our lives together. We, we also uh, see someone that is looking a, a little bit concerned or with the weight of the world on them, and we walk up to them and say, what's going on? Are you okay? And we also spend time talking about how we can uh, maybe get together and go over to so-and-so's house to do some work for them together. There's a lot of things that happen together when the church comes together. In fact, what, what I want to talk about this morning is a, it's a very familiar text. And, and so this is not one of those sermons where you're going to learn something new. This is stuff that we've heard all of our lives. But I think it's good, as Paul said, to bring to your remembrance some things. It's the text that talks about don't forsake the assembly. That's where we're headed. In fact, this text is what we sometimes call the lettuce text. Because it kept saying, let us do this and let us do that. So it's a lettuce patch. It's really the conclusion that the Hebrew writer has been headed to. He has this long argument. It's the longest extended argument in all of Scripture, even though he interrupts it with some, uh, some call to action sort of text along the way. But he comes to this conclusion uh, after he's made the point that Jesus is better than the Old Testament system. He's better than angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than the Old Testament priests. He's just better, and now he's going to call them to action um, with some lettuces. It's the third lettuce that we really want to talk about, but in order to look at the context, let's look at the other lettuces as well. First he says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So first of all, let us draw near to God boldly. In fact, the imagery that he used in a couple of verses before is Jesus holding open the curtain, the curtain that separates the holy from the most holy place, to allow us to walk boldly into the very presence of God. We have had our hearts sprinkled and cleansed We've had our bodies washed with pure water in baptism. And so now, because of the sanctification that has taken place through Christ, we can walk 
into the very presence of God. Let us do that. And let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Satan doesn't really try, maybe with some, but mostly he doesn't really try to get us to, walk, to wake up one day and, and look at God and go, oh, phooey. He doesn't cause us to do that. That's not the way he works. What he does is gradually, with things that happen in our lives and thoughts he plants in our mind, he wants us to give up on the hope that God gives us. And so the writer here says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Things may be bad now. The church that uh, the, the Hebrew writer is writing to is going through some difficulties. And we've gone through you know, a couple of years of difficulty with this pandemic. And gradually, Satan wants us just to give up on the hope that we profess that God is in control and that God is going to bring us victoriously to the end. So let us hold to our hope. And then finally he says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us, okay, we need to hold on to our hope. And one part of that is let us try to spur one another on to hold on to our hope, to do good deeds for others, to love one another. It's an interesting word, let us, let us be the burr under the saddle of each other. To spur us. The only other time that particular word is used in the New Testament is when Paul and Barnabas are having their sharp disagreement with each other over whether to take John Mark on the second missionary journey or not. Um, now, I would suggest to you that Paul and Barnabas in this disagreement were in real relationship with, they weren't just sitting in the same room together but they were sharply involved with each other. And so the writer here is saying, we need to do that. We need to sharply involve each other to motivate each other to love and good deeds. And then he goes on to the next verse, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. He's writing to uh, Christians who aren't just you know, missing every other week or so. They have turned their backs on the Christian assembly and have gone back to the synagogue because that's a lot easier for them. Their Christian affiliation was causing difficulties in their lives as they lived in a Jewish community. And so the Hebrew writer says, don't do that. Don't give up meeting together. Uh, some are already doing that. But encourage one another. Keep meeting together to encourage each other. And all the more as you see the return of Christ getting nearer and nearer as it does every day and has ever since Jesus has left. So don't quit meeting together, but encourage each other. So why is it that we've come to church I didn't come to church to drink coffee. Well, you know, if you can have a conversation with somebody while you're drinking coffee and encourage them, then maybe that's exactly why you came to church. Uh, have we come to church to worship God? Absolutely. If that worship causes us to be encouraged in our daily lives. Um, what exactly does the Hebrew writer say, or even the rest of the New Testament say, happens when the church assembles. I mean, we talk about, yes, the church comes together to worship God, but the church stays apart to worship God, too. The Bible never explains exactly what happens. It comes really close in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 14 when it talks about you know, speaking in tongues and prophesying. Each one of you has a psalm. Each one of you has a, a prophecy. Each one of you has a tongue. Do that decently in order. But of course, we don't use that as the pattern of what happens when we come together. The point of the assembly is for Christians to come together to encourage one another to keep on living the Christian lives. Now, I think we have camouflaged that pretty well because what are you doing right now? 
you're sitting looking at the back of someone's head and sneaking a peek at your watch to make, see how much longer I'm going to keep going, right? Now, the point of why we come together is to encourage one another. Does the sermon do that? Boy, I hope so, occasionally, that you get something from the sermon that encourages you. Does the singing do that? Absolutely, I hope it does. I'll, I'll give you a little um, confession, I guess. There is, sometimes I pick out all the songs. Most often, the song leaders, whoever is going to be leading worship, pick out the songs, and I make a suggestion. Like today, Light the Fire was, was my suggestion because you know, I had a text to go with it, and it fit into what we're doing, and that sort of thing. Um, but almost always, when I go home, one of the songs that we sang is going through my head like an earworm. Now, with this musical ear or musical hallucination thing that I got, sometimes it's actually playing in my head, but there's usually a song that I remember from church. Um, it's not always my favorite song. Sometimes it's the least favorite song. You know, it, it may be the old one that I'm more familiar with. That's the one that keeps playing in my ear. But that's what songs are supposed to do. It takes the teaching and causes you to sort of remember it. Sometimes it's the communion diva that we remember that really encourages us, brings tears to our eyes. But the point of the assembly is the assembly. Sometimes what makes all the difference in the world is a conversation that you have with somebody after church is over. And you might not remember what the sermon was. You might not remember what the songs were. But you remember that conversation where somebody tells you, boy, you know, I like that shirt you're wearing today. That's really sharp. And that just kind of encourages you. And that's what you take home. The point of the assembly is the assembly. Over two years ago, uh, we were just blindsided by this COVID-19 thing. In fact, we were kind of in denial because we waited until Saturday before we stopped meeting together to finally decide that we weren't going to meet together that Sunday. We thought the whole thing was, you know, some kind of communist plot or something that we kept reading about in the paper. And so that Saturday, the elders, uh, you know, called each other. We decided we're going to, as we send out the flock note, and even that Sunday, the elders and Roger and I sat in the lobby and sat around talking about, boy, you know, it's probably going to be two or three weeks before we can get together again. And, and Joe and Art, um, with their gloves on and their masks on, they went out, several people came anyway, and they went out with the communion and gave them communion. But we thought that was just going to be just really a, a short sort of thing, as it turned out. It was uh, six months to a year before we, it depends how you count. Because for a while, we, there was 10 to 15 people that met together to watch the online service together. And boy, those first online services were pretty kind of rough, thrown together. We really weren't set up to do that sort of thing. And then we hit on a way where we could uh, videotape everything, videotape prayers and and, and the sermon, and so we, we had a video stream with a chat uh, software. We could chat together. I was constantly annoyed that it was during the sermon. That's when people wanted to, wanted to chat together. Um, anyway, that's just the way that it, that it was. But it, we didn't let us keep up with each other. And then gradually, we came to a live stream sort of thing. And now, uh, the only concessions that we make to COVID-19 is we're still doing the rip and sip, um, you know, the little communion cups sort of thing. We're not passing trays uh, anymore. And we're st still singing for the most part with uh, music tracks. Eventually, uh, we'll go back to, to, to singing our own stuff, I guess. You know, we were able to sort of duplicate um, what happens in worship on the line. And that was a very important thing for us to do. So now gradually we're coming back. And the only thing that really hasn't come back completely, people. 
if we have, in fact, today, I don't think we have, they didn't expect us to have a big crowd today because it's a Memorial Day weekend. Traditionally, since most of our folks are from other places, when you have a long weekend, we have a light crowd. Understand that. But generally, if we have on Sunday morning half of the people that we used to have, we think that's a good Sunday. And for some reason, some ways, that's understandable. We lost a lot of people uh, in that first year of the pandemic. We had a lot of people that were active members um, that uh, were here all the time. And while we were apart, they got orders and left. Or they retired and left. And we never saw them again because they were gone by the time we came back together. We had four people that died during the um, the pandemic that we never saw again back together. Um, there's, you know, we're an older church. You know, some of you have gotten older in, in, in the last several years. And so we intentionally were very conservative in how we treated the pandemic because the last thing that we wanted is for somebody to catch COVID uh, at, uh, at church. But that doesn't explain everything, right? I think that there are some of us that just kind of got used to being lazy and got used to the idea that of not getting up on Sunday morning and it's just easy to roll out of bed about 10, 15, turn the television or the computer or get your phone ready and have church online. There's still some many legitimate reasons to continue. We're not thinking about starting, uh, about stopping the online service. We want that to get better and better. And I hope it has run completely smooth this morning. If it didn't, for those of you out online, Tony's running the service, so you can blame him. Um, and we're going to continue to do that. Legitimate reasons, it is a necessity for people that continue to be shut in because of their health and because uh, they're not ready to take a chance in a crowd of people. We're going to continue to offer that. It's still a major convenience if you're traveling and can still, you can maybe go somewhere to where, where you are, but you can still log in and see what's going on back home and type your uh, hellos and, and that sort of thing. And, and really, I wish we would be more active in the chat part so that we know, because it's hard to know exactly who's there if they don't identify themselves. But you know, what we can do with our online service is provide content. What we can't really do is provide community. You know, let's face it, it's hard for me to admit that. Mike, I don't know whether you would want to admit this, but if you're going to get in the habit of watching sermons on YouTube, there's a lot better ones to watch than mine, right? Thank you for not agreeing <laughs> with that. I was waiting for somebody to shout amen. Um, and, you know, you can listen to the exact same songs that we use. Because most of Praise and Harmony's songs that we kind of use as our base are, are there online. You can sing along with, with a lot better worship music or even the same worship music. It won't be led as well, Perry, but you can sing along with it. But the one thing you can't do on, with the online service is the point of why we worship together. Community. The whole point of the church coming together is coming together. And we can sort of approximate that during the pandemic. But if the reason that you're not coming to church every week is because it's so convenient to get it online. This is not an ultimatum. We're going to continue to offer the service online my, I went to way too much trouble getting to where we could do that for us to stop it now. But I just want you to think. In fact, that's what most sermons are. Hopefully to get us to think in, in certain directions. So let's 
focus on community because, frankly, we can get content other places. One of the speakers at Pepperdine this past year, which <laughs> unfortunately we didn't go, Lord willing, we'll be in, in Malibu next year and, and be there uh, for it in person. But one of the speakers said that one of the responses of the church um, after COVID has got to be focusing on community together, even at the expense of content. He says, it, he suggested that it, it, just getting together for a picnic like we had a couple of weeks ago may be more important than, than, than offering a teaching time. Because we've gotten used to the, to the fact of finding teaching moments other places. We just need to stress community more and more. So I just want you to think about that uh, today. And I, I, I know that a lot of folks that tuned in online are, are you know, wishing they, or they've already logged back off because it feels like I'm fussing at them. I think offering an, an online option like we do and will continue to do is extremely important. But I think it's time for us to focus on the power of community.